Good afternoon. We will go ahead and reconvene our meeting. And I would ask that you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now I'll ask Director Mitchell to offer our land acknowledgement. Thank you. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Snohomish, and Tulalip peoples. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land on whose shoulders we stand. In Ever Public Schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Thank you. We have already done our roll call earlier, so we will go ahead and we've also done our adoption of an agenda. So we will move forward to recognition. And tonight we do not have a recognition. Which takes us to the superintendent's report. Dr. Salzman. I don't think we did. We did. We did. We did. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Just a dumpy minute. So we need to back up and do it all over again. Okay. My apologies. We are going to back up <clears throat> and we're going to take a uh, roll call. President Mason. Present. Vice President Lucene. Present. Director Mason. Oops, sorry. Director Burke. Present. Director Mitchell. Present. Director Nichols. Thank you. Dr. Salzman, may you please give us an overview of the CCM's agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public this evening. Tonight's agenda contains the following. The superintendent's report, a separate for board comments, a separate for public comments, a separate for routine business, a separate for strategic project project marketing, a separate for new business, and upcoming agenda items. Since so publishing the agenda, changes have been made by the 10.02 approval of the personnel report, where retirement was added, and item 10.07 acceptance of the 2012 fiscal advisory council report. The pay terms and formatting were corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as is. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and move to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The agenda is adopted. Okay, that takes us to recognitions. And again, we do not have a recognition scheduled for this evening, so we will move to the superintendent's report. Dr. Salsa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, tonight we have a lot of celebrating to do. Because last Thursday, we saw 59 amazing graduates celebrate commencement at Sequoia High School. What a special night that was. Talk about determination. Just wonderful to be there and partake in that. And Saturday, with the sun shining out in our stadium, a full day starting at 11 a.m., Cascade High School began their, their, our day with commencement, followed by Jackson High School's graduating at 3 p.m. And the day out of that with Everett High School's graduating at 7 p.m. What an incredible few days of graduation. It just shows us a system of kindergarten to 12th grade we have a great deal of college. But there's another group that graduated as well. The Project Search class of 2021 has officially graduated. Project Search is our innovative school to work transition program for students with disabilities. Three of our seven interns already found paid jobs. Congratulations to some incredible group of students. And some of our Project Search students work at Providence Hospital. Very, very special. And then finally, a young man 
and Morgan Walters from Sealwood Elementary School, the second in the nation, second in the nation in an art class. He read 300 books this year, and there are 2,145 they are points. I just want to share something with my say way to go to live, because readers are readers. I called Will. I called his house. I had a wonderful talk with Will. I thought I was talking to a college graduate. He <laughs> said, Dr. Saltzman, I set goals, and I met my goals. And that's what I was going to do is to read. We had a wonderful discussion, and I'm very proud to say that William will impress me, and to his parents as well, congratulations. I want to share that with all of this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salzman. That takes us to board comments, usually board and super student representative comments, but tonight we have none because school is out. <laughs> so I think we'll start with Director Byrne, please. Thank you so much. Um, and I kind of have to echo Dr. Salzman's comments. Um, it was great to be at graduation, like to be these scholars, um, amazing alumni, actually. And I think a couple of things I wanted to display at graduation. I want to say it in every case of 59 kiddos, 24 were college bound recipients. And that just is a testament to the middle school. It is a testament to the cycle of my heart. Because the moment that somebody reached out, stuck with these kiddos in middle school, so they didn't find that promise. And then now, over the finish line, they fill that promise. So I, I, this was beyond, um, beyond words to see that happen in the half of our support class. Um, the other thing I just wanted to recognize is that we have some amazing scholars, um, there's AP students and all the accolades and, and congratulatory remarks, but also um, I just need to shout out our students who graduated. Sometimes I feel like high school needs to be this rush of, I did 10 AP classes, I did five AP classes, I did this, I mean, I got tired sometimes listening to um, how busy these kiddos must have been during a public health crisis, and I think it's amazing, but I think it's amazing when you're just a, I shouldn't say just, but when you're a kid in high school, and you do four years, and you go to your classes, and you get great grades, and you, you keep it moving. So just a shout out to those alumni who maybe didn't get those um, huge accolades, awards, etc., but they did it, and they did it amazingly during one of the most difficult times in our um, nation's history. So I just I can be proud as a director and as a parent of this district. Thank you. Um, well, I mourn 2020. Um, it was so wonderful to see 2021 outside to see the crowds to see everybody i'm wearing this mask um, which was given to me on saturday to honor all four of our schools and just what an amazing time and and, and i think that you know the speeches of the students are always so heartfelt but i felt this year i, I had some tears in my eyes um because it is a different year um, but also the fact the diversity of our district to have a student speaker who is a is a first generation Lebanese if I heard correctly a student who is an immigrant from Ghana and a student who's a third generation ever high I mean that just represents really the, the students in our district but then um, two Saturdays ago I was at one of the last next vaccination clinics for Sonoma County where I spoke to a whole lot of students and um, there's a whole lot of excitement for school to be open next year, both from parents and students. Also talk to a student who really is liking the remote and thinks he does better, so I let him know that Everett has a program and make sure his parents reach out. Um, but a whole lot of excitement and a whole lot of young people, and mostly Edmond School District getting vaccinated, but um, just a whole lot of excitement for next September. So thank you. So, uh, as the director mentioned, I, I was super proud of you with my first uh, ever school district set of graduations uh, as a board member. And uh, similarly, there were several points in the ceremonies that I wanted to check out. Um, and not that you could tell from the stage, <laughs> but, uh, you know, lots of, of pride and lots of, it was very interesting to see the faces of these graduates come across the stage because they were all at once terrified and so happy to be done and um, you, you can really tell um, 
give us an elite that gives us a performing walk out the stage. Um, and I do also want to say to those graduates that, you know, in this in this district, we put a lot of emphasis on the high school and beyond that, and we want you to graduate all these things. If you don't know, that's okay. That's part of the process of growing up. Go out, explore, learn. Most of all, take a moment to be proud of what you did, what you wanted to do. Whether it took you four years or five years, doesn't matter. You finish. Um, and we're proud of you for the people. Wish you the best um, going forward. I, I would like to just say, and I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget or miss anybody. Congratulations to the class of 2021. I attended all of our high school commencement ceremonies. And most of all, right now, I would like to thank, I would like to thank each and every parent in our district and each teacher, administrator, success coordinator in our district who are achieving over 1,200 graduates. You have actually put 1,200 graduates out on the street into their career, into the global world. Career, workforce, or as Director uh, Nichols said, in the world where they can find out what they want to do for the rest of their lives. And they can change it. I've changed my perspective on my life many times. I've done different things. And they can do the same thing. But we have successfully graduated over 1,200 students. But teachers and parents, in this last year, we have done amazing things. I have a, a student in your classroom, but not in your classroom, to have a, a student at the dinner table going to class and a parent saying, Nope, you're going to do your classwork. You've done amazing things in this past 18, no, 15 months. 15 months. And thank you for doing that. We didn't ask you first to be a teacher, but you were a teacher parent. Every parent, you were. And you get an outstanding job. And we will never forget that you are the first teacher for that student. And we're only here as a collaborative group, partnering with you to ensure their success. So thank you, staff. Thank you, administrator. For succeeding in getting over 1,200 students out the door and to their career future. Thank you. Thank you, directors. Well, I think the graduation topic has been thoroughly covered quite well by my fellow directors, I will say. Um, so I, I concur with many of the, the feelings, emotions, everything, um, and their appreciation too for um, staff and parents. Um, and then my, my other activities, I got to attend virtually, unfortunately still this year, the Athletics Awards. Um, and those are just, I, I've been able to do that the last several years, and again, just so inspiring. I mean, these are truly some of our most talented athletes. We have a, a whole lot of students that participate in sports. Um, these are the individuals that really rise to the top. And um, they're also not surprisingly typically very academically accomplished as well. And um, it just is such an inspiration to be able to um, hear from these students <clears throat> and, and have them share their experiences in our, our schools. Um, very uplifting. Um, and then on to graduation. So it's just been a couple months of really great celebrations. So I think with that, we will go ahead and move on to our next section, 9.0, which is public comments. And we do have one public comment tonight. Our first speaker tonight is a Cedarwood Elementary teacher and district resident. Um, I would like to call Carol Coke to the podium. And yes, come on up. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Our, um, I don't know if you know how this works, but we have three lights up there. And the first one is the green light, and that gives you, um, that's your go button. <laughs> and then I, 
you have your three minutes. The yellow indicates that you have 30 seconds left, and the red is the expiration of your time. So whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, it's good to see all of you guys in person instead of on the little screen. Um, and I didn't know that you were going to read off that I'm from Cedarwood and all that other stuff, or I might have written something different. <laughs> um, the reason that I'm here is to express my undying gratitude to you, to you, for allowing us to celebrate Robert at the stadium. There are countless people around the world who have not been able to celebrate their people because of COVID and you all let us do that. And I, I will be forever grateful that you let us do that. Um, my healing is, is stronger because of that. I, I, I don't know how families have done it without being able to celebrate their person. So I'm, I can't express for the rest of my life how, how much that means to my whole family. Um, we are making it. Uh, your graduations worked. Robert would have been the person in the background that you never would have seen. Um, and he took a lot of pride in his work. A lot of pride in his work. Um, this district meant a lot to him. The kids meant the most to him. And he fought so hard because I heard him because he was working from home. Um, and before I was back in the classroom, he, he worked hard for the students and they were recognized and they did graduate and it was kind of brilliant. So, um, good work is happening here. He was part of a great team and really thank you guys from the bottom of my heart um, for letting us be who we are for, um, 17 years ago, we weren't here. I remember sitting picture your room about right here, but it was in the other building, the district building, when we were introduced as a family, all four of us sat on there. My daughter was going into first grade, our son going into third grade. They could care less that we were in that room, but dad made them go, <laughs> um, being introduced as the athletic director. And here we are. Um, and he's not in the room to celebrate with everything that he's done. So you guys allowed him to gain a confidence that he didn't know he could have. He did not believe he came over here to interview to have a job. He believed he was interviewing um, for practice. And he called me at a school in Central Kitsap and said, um, I got the job. <laughs> and we just bought a house just a couple months prior to that. I said, you what? Um, no, no, I'll commute. And I thought, no, you won't. That's insane. So you gave him the wings, the, the wherewithal, whatever, the confidence that he needed. And, and he took pride in everything he did here. So I guess that's what I wanted to say. I wanted to come and say thank you to all of you and for helping raise our kids and being the principals of my students and my, my children, I guess they're my children, I think, um, and teaching my Girl Scouts how to tie knots in my living room. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you, thank you. And that's it. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing that with us. I think we all think we're just pretty useful for those words. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to the consent agenda. Dr. Salzman, may you please provide an overview? Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick, Chair. Uh, the board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items such as meeting minutes, personal action, expect action, surplus list. Which we have to pay back. Sometimes it feels like a pair of extra new bars or routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the board in the prior report or only a week before the board meeting. This gives directors time to ask staff questions or to consider discussion about the policy implications of those items. The board votes on the consent agenda in a single motion. By its definition, a consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office received no questions regarding items on the consent agenda. The consent agenda is presented and published the board approved. 
Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So it has been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda as presented. Would any director like to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it in the new business section of the agenda? Hearing no request, we will go ahead and move to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The consent agenda is approved. Our next item of business is 11.0 Strategic Progress Monitoring, and tonight we have an update on our integrated technology plan. I believe Mr. Beckley will probably get us started and have a few guest speakers join him. Yes. Good evening. Let me cue this up. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. I am excited to join you this afternoon to uh, share our annual report on the status of the Integrated Technology Plan. Joining me this afternoon is John Budewig, our LMS Director, and Ken Toyn, our Director of Network Services. And in all year, but especially during this year of COVID, we uh, express gratitude for all the areas of our district that work together. Uh, to advance the integrated technology plan. And we've seen over the last five years as we've come to share this update with you, how increasingly there is tremendous growth with all aspects of our district working together to integrate technology. Um, as we were putting this presentation together, we see clear evidence that our district has embraced this. And this is a real celebration. I think this is a real uh, great uh, feat of our district to uh, take this integrated technology plan and as we share this information with you today everybody in this room has had a part in it, it uh, it's the work that's part of the integrated technology plan but it represents the work of all of our departments uh, in instruction and in operations a real celebration and i think accomplishment since the adoption of the six-year integrated technology plan, uh, we've come before the board to share uh, our progress and accomplishments to date to talk about the upcoming year. And we will do that again uh, today. Uh, as we prepare to enter the final year of this six-year plan, we're also gonna spend a little bit of time highlighting the implications and <coughs> aspects that will be in the refresh 2022 integrated technology plan. Um, it's been integrated into the strategic plan and supports the four pillars of climate, culture, systems, and instruction. And you're here in this update how this plan uh, is anchored to these four pillars. These are the six goal areas of the plan with each of these goals are activities and some key performance indicators. And you've seen this before. Uh, the language of this is uh, centered on the National Technology, Educational Technology Plan. We've organized our presentation around these goal areas. And you'll see the icon on each slide is referencing the goal area that it's, it's, uh, it's talking about. And we've done some combining of some of those goal areas. And so we'll share what's been accomplished to date, what's upcoming, and, and implications for that 2022 refresh. So we begin to talk about infrastructure. And the reason we choose this is that to support a robust integrated technology plan, you have to first ensure you have equitable access so that it's it's available when and where uh, it is needed. So I, I want to can just kind of kick things off talking about the goal area of infrastructure. Good evening. Uh, when we were uh, preparing for this presentation, uh, the district leader asked us, why, why start with infrastructure? Does that make sense? Uh, well, in our mind, without the investment in the technology infrastructure, the foundation of what we're going to talk about is it's it's required to be in place and to be strong to accomplish anything else that you're going to hear tonight. Without a solid foundation, uh, what you hear tonight would not have taken place. Uh, for example, and, and from a, an accomplishments perspective, uh, we're happy to announce that we've got a, a dedicated computer in the hands of each student. Uh, that's a huge accomplishment, a great milestone and one that the district should be proud of. Uh, moving from a relatively closed network to a network that is, allows for access outside of the buildings, uh, really gives us some opportunities for, 
for innovative learning opportunities going forward. Uh, and then finally, finally maintain the availability for the updated devices for our teachers. We're in the process right now of providing new teacher devices to the four to five year old devices we rolled out earlier as part of the plan. So that's our life cycle management strategy. From a next steps, next steps perspective, looking ahead, we plan to systematically keep our student devices and classroom technology regularly updated. So you'll see that from this time going forward, we're going to annually uh, select the, the you know, various devices that need to be upgraded that are four or five years old, that kind of thing. So we're going into the high schools, or the high school of River Height and Sequoia, and we'll be placing those student devices this fall. Again, as a result of them being the first ones that won the one devices uh, five years ago. And uh, we're also going to maintain and uh, grow our uh, data center systems. We want to make sure that that's in, in, that's in place so that we can be ready for the growth that we anticipate for the next, well, forever at, at this point. And from an outlook perspective, um, we're going to focus on our infrastructure, from an inter infrastructure perspective, we're going to focus on maintaining um, the core systems that we have in place. We're going to maintain the growth uh, to the various classroom technologies, as well as make sure we stay as secure as possible. With a, with a boundless or borderless network, we need to be very cognizant of the risks that we have out there in the scary world related to the internet. And uh, those take some focused, uh, investments and attention and kind of maintain that as much as we can. I would like to point out before I transition to Joanne is the the accomplishments that you're going to hear tonight and the ones I just described are all the direct result of the board's leadership and the community's support uh, with the 2016 levy and bond measures. Uh, there's no way we could have accomplished any of this without that trust and support from our communities. And we're very grateful for that. And I'll turn the time over to uh, Joanne, where she can talk to us about where the rubber hits the road. So what our community envisioned was our students being able to leverage technology effectively to prepare them for a future, but to also to live in a present that is very technology rich. And I want to celebrate that every staff member and student and family has grown tremendously. The learning curve that they have been on is intense and they've done well. And in its design, we have defined in the ITP, I'm proud to say, our staff and students and families were defined as learners from the beginning. So we were able to leverage that mindset of everyone as a technology learner and it showed up in our staff in all departments. Um, thank you. Our progress to date uh, in the implementation really aligns with instructional uh, in a crossroads of technology uh, learning and assessment being at, at, a, at an integrated whole. It's very hard for us to separate the three just as it is in good classroom instruction. So as we talk about the three together, we want to talk about the SAMR model as being at the heart. We now look at that as an organization. We have been required to substitute. And so beyond substitution, though, what we've seen is our teachers embrace that augmentation. You see that in software that has collaboration and media tools um, being leveraged, that no longer are they just using it for online textbooks, but we're actually using it as interactive platforms to make learning more accessible for more of our students. Our accessibility tool use has increased dramatically the text-to-speech, the readers, the things that help the access for all of our students is quite impressive. When we look at online media, we no longer watch videos, we interact with them. Canvas Studio allows for an ongoing discussion that as students participate synchronously, they're able to hear the thinking and thoughts of their, of their peers. Our librarians have engaged our students. I'm excited about the AR goals. They've been allowed to put holds on from home. Our libraries figured out how to do that so they could come and pick up their books. Um, and that's part of the technology strategies in play, as well as making Canvas, within Canvas, the library system an automatic login this year. To, again, ease of access has been a goal. We've seen our high schools formalize peer coaching. 
Um, you saw witness of that with the Desmos demonstration, which has now moved way beyond mathematics and is being used in multiple disciplines for more effective feedback loop for our students. And that's the innovation of our high school teachers who've had time dedicated to learn those tools and leverage them. We see our experienced middle school facilitators help our middle schools who are truly actually in their one-to-one -one implementation years. Uh, we had four elementary schools go one-to-one -one during COVID. And so it's an amazing growth, um, the support of our instructional technology professional developers to keep that work going. We've also seen our elementary staff expand into unchartered waters where they've had to learn the virtual classroom of Canvas for some who have not yet logged into their computers as a classroom prior to going home. In learning, we see academic leadership has adopted the technology adaptive intervention softwares like iReady and Language Live, which are part of Project Red success criteria. We look at the dramatic learning that's taken place around synchronous sessions, Zoom tools, instruction strategies for managing online meetings and classroom sessions have been a tremendous collaborative effort between our IT staff and our professional developers. Canvas is now common ground and it's taking root. Video content is there to support our students and learning has expanded to we now have a rich reference library going into blended learning next year. Our assessment professional development has been for the district and building administrators in a common assessment building platform of performance matters. And it's now being leveraged both at the district building levels and with individual teachers. This allows for assessment design and implementation that informs the teacher and the learner with ready access to student level assessments and item analysis to inform the learning. As we look forward to our next immediate steps, we think there's a worthy celebration, but we need to keep climbing that SAMR ladder. <laughs> We need in teaching that we're going to work with representative teachers at each site to gather up those lessons and create a bank so teachers can, the teachers who struggled more have examples of how they can build more. We are building out common ground at all schools for Canvas. I have 95 of my 250 Canvas signed up for becoming mentors in their building right now, and they've had about a week's notice. So we're doing good. We've expanded professional learning to student creation and collaboration technologies. We're focusing on 24-7 access to resources for our students. In learning, we're creating an elementary network of tech explorers among the teachers. And we have ongoing technology training for all our work groups planned and I'm hoping to coordinate with our new professional development director for that ongoing work. In assessment performance matters, we'll continue professional development working with schools at their readiness level. And we will be deepening in the use at the building level with the assessment department working to ensure that all staff have the skills they need to build this powerful tool, analyze student performance, and guide schools in their improvement planning and instruction. So as we do our outlook, I'm just so excited about the, the strategies in the, the strategic initiatives because they will guide the next iteration of the ITP but the integrated technology plan will also complement those initiatives. In teaching, we see moving beyond technology to transforming, via technology implementation to transforming learning, to personalize that learning by the power of technology to provide real-time actionable feedback. In learning, we see involving students in the integration work more and more, so their voice becomes alive in the ITP, and that there are places and spaces where they can get credited opportunities for their own growth in the industry of technology. We see safety and security awareness as an ongoing need for all learners woven into our online activities to promote and share with broader audiences. In an assessment, we see the development of self-check formative assessments, leveraging new technologies such as uh, video prompts and scenario based to continue to accelerate that, to accelerate that actionable feedback. We're very excited as we look forward to the next iteration of our work, and we're grateful for what we've been able to do so far. So we're looking at the outreach goal. This is a, a key component of the plan, and has never been more important than this past year. Uh, one of the key action steps in the goal area is to communicate with our staff, families, and the community in a variety of, of venues. And this uh, slide highlights some of those accomplishments this year. Uh, 
we've expanded parent education outreach and technology support a couple of key examples are the use of parent university where we located technology resources for families this has been a partnership with our communications team uh, also the let's connect meetings uh, that started this year uh, facilitated i'm thinking of the ones early in the year that were facilitated by our regional superintendents that really focused on what's your experience at home how can we better support your technology needs those sort of outreach examples uh, are, are real accomplishments and highlights for the year. Also, during COVID, we rolled out that online enrollment option and, and expanded it to include annual updates. So over 2,500 new student enrollments uh, were uh, received and completed uh, using this method. We already have seen about uh, 1,100 new enrollments uh, for next year using this method. And the updates, we continue to promote that, is just over 7,000 families have done, used the online enrollment option to, bring, to include updates. Uh, partnering with our communications team again and outreach, uh, they've been a great, they've been a great partner. Uh, we've connected our families to resources to ensure they are able to uh, access broadband. Uh, so the free internet, OSPI free internet program, this was a a great outreach uh, project that uh, Kathy's team and, and our team worked together on uh, to move from uh, relying on hotspots to uh, looking at broadband. And we also partnered with our communications team on that website refresh, which has been a great experience and looks so great and, and has uh, nice user uh, accessibility. And, and the addition of the Let's Talk is another outreach tool uh, where parents have a, a, a clear method of being able to ask for assistance. Uh, one of the activities in this goal area is to provide policy explanations and resources and we really utilize our technology handbook to do that and that's on every student's device on their desktop and is also available on our website uh, for them to be able to access as, as a resource and looking ahead to this next year for outreach uh, we're going to be increasing courses and information and really moving uh, where we increase the resources that we have in canvas for things like new device training for students and, and uh, how to access Google Drive and Office 365 and, and include more sort of learning tools within Canvas to be able to do that. Um, this year we focused on connecting parents, uh, I mentioned parent university, on getting technology support. And next year it, our plan is to expand that to be more of a technology, a parent uh, uh, training area, the, almost uh, an idea not of uh, a more of a parent academy from just getting technology support, but learning about technology and how they can enrich their understanding of, of that as, a, as being able to support that at home. We'll continue to uh, outreach to our business communities and agencies. I think they're going to be a key help in connecting our, our families with broadband access and, and moving again from the reliance on hotspots. Right now we have the emergency broadband benefit, which is uh, through a uh, federal program that offers reduced rate uh, uh, for families that qualify. There, I am thinking as we continue to outreach to our area communities and business partners to be able to expand offerings for, for families to be able to, to access that as a, as a way of uh, getting internet access at home. And I just like to also highlight the Technology Advisory Council. This has been a, a tremendous asset to our group and thank you to the, the method of how we applied for uh, technology, really that promotion of the community to apply for uh, members to be added and we added some great excited new members and we'll continue to want to expand that and diversify who we have on our committee and what parts of the district they represent to give us a great, a great voice moving forward, but really grateful for our Technology Advisory Council. Um, and in, in, in looking ahead for the for the next uh, focus uh, for the 2022 and, and beyond uh, is really the idea of engaging the, the aspect of peer support for technology support and, and that being an aspect of how we can connect our students in a learning environment uh, in the school to be able to almost act as an extension of our help desk and help support inside the building. And, embracing innovative technologies and that fostering of that in our in our district being a real central to the, the next iteration of our of our technology plan and looking ahead to the last goal area on, under under leadership is uh, is really fully leveraging technology within their leadership roles uh, to strengthen teaching learning and operations and we've seen that grow tremendously over the last five years 
Uh, increasingly, our leaders are building integrating technology into their plans, whether it's their department work plan, their school improvement plan. We see it embedded in the technology work as we walk through uh, our buildings. Um, the, you could also see it in, our, in the instructional review process. And, and uh, this year, we engaged with our administrators and supervisors uh, during their level meetings and had time on the agenda to almost have it be uh, so for some to be learning about how they could utilize technology as a way of increasing their efficiency. And we engaged in our operational teams with our operational department head group, uh, engaged them about what their needs were with how they could integrate it into their uh, work uh, as, a, as a group. Updates to our policies and procedures include the digital tool uh, review process and curriculum adoptions, which has been a, a great uh, promotion from our leadership group. Uh, during the adoption process, there's a technology review that occurs within the process itself, and, it, and, that, and that idea of an awareness of cost, just not just in the initial year, but, but beyond. Uh, leaders have been actively engaged in helping look for sustainable uh, funding sources and, and resources that are out there, whether it be by grants or other programs. Over the last five years, uh, we've moved from early adopters with Canvas to that being our LMS. That's been a huge accomplishment. And yes, COVID did push us into that, uh, but uh, we've seen leaders really embrace that uh, with their staffs and reach out about how we can connect with them. Our I, I wanna highlight the district data governance team, which uh, meets regularly and communicates regularly. Uh, it's a group of uh, key data and system stewards that work together to ensure uh, data privacy and security is maintained with uh, our operations. Uh, we, uh, Ken mentioned at the beginning is such a huge uh, importance for us uh, moving forward. And the key here, I, I would say, for an accomplishment is the leaders really wanting to learn more. That idea of professional learning in all of the departments and how they as leaders can uh, embrace that and how they can utilize us as partners to ensure that it's occurring in their, in their groups. For next steps looking ahead, um, really, as Joanne mentioned, we want to apply learning what we learned in this last uh, year and a half uh, during our modes to embed this uh, increasingly in our operations and instructional improvement plans to leverage the, the concepts in the integrated technology plan that, that emphasize that culture of innovation uh, into the strategic plan development and our strategic plan refresh um, to continue to strengthen the digital review, review process and engage our leaders in how to uh, support uh, doing this in a safe, secure environment uh, and how we can engage our leaders in the sustainability of the one-to-one -one through the passage of the next capital technology plan, which uh, will be a focus for us this year coming up. So the outlook looking ahead is to move from to second order change, to move further up that, uh, climb up that SAMR ladder and engaging our leaders and how they can work alongside us to, to, to work towards that. Uh, technology, uh, competencies uh, articulated into instructional maps intersecting with social and emotional learning and de uh, digital citizenship is, for example, but deeper integration and collaboration with our teams, the academics teams, the special services, teaching and learning, our operational teams, just continuing to get work deeper and deeper in support and in partnership with those groups and, and how, as leaders, we can work together to, to support the plan moving ahead. So evolving the plan, as I said, this is the last year of the integrated technology plan and the review process is already underway. That technology advisory council has been spending this past year, we're looking at the integrated technology plan, where are we at, what's its status, what are the implications for what we should carry forward, what should we tweak? So that's been occurring. We're working on drafting the next version over the next couple of months based on that feedback and then begin to engage our stakeholder groups, which you see listed there throughout the next school year with the idea of when I'm uh, back with you a year from now uh, at the board presentation doing the update, I'll be sharing with you some of the highlights of the next plan of what it looks like from this point moving forward. But we share today some of the highlights of what we envision being part of that. Um, so today we reviewed the, the plan to date, what it's gonna look like in the year ahead and some highlights of the year moving forward and would uh, welcome any questions that you might have. <laughs> well, thank you. And at this time, I typically would say thank you for a very robust and good presentation. But I want to take a moment to thank you for.
and Joanne and Ken for your leadership this past year. You guys have been instrumental in everything we could do, and I can't think of another area of operations district-wide that has been so impactful in terms of keeping us afloat and moving us forward. It's been a tremendous lift, and I'm just going to say thank you very, very much for that. Um, I also want to mention one thing the community, as you started out with, um, as Ken did, on um, funding the 2016 capital levy, because without that funding, the state would not have covered the cost for these devices into student hands, and it just so happened to coincidentally coincide with a pandemic <laughs> that we got devices into students' hands right at the, about the right time. I know there's a little scramble at the end there, but, um, you know, we fortunately were so well positioned for this, um, having had the training and the integrated technology plan, the plan for this kind of event, not that we wanted to or, or were hoping to, but um, I really felt like we came out ahead of the game in terms of the unknown um, because of all the work that we've done today, that you've done today. So um, that was great. And it will be wonderful today that the state considers technology part of basic education. You know, it is 2021. So anyhow, I will continue to advocate for that. Yes. Uh, directors, do you have questions? Yes, Director Nichols. Uh, I want to echo what the president has said about the president and the folks who have done last year. Um, it's been phenomenal uh, helping folks with our district um, and doing everything to be able to come up with proponent of technology, advancing technology in our education system. Um, and so, to that point, uh, my first question is um, when you talked about infrastructure earlier, so my, my father was a systems guy for the entire career, and he used to take me to uh, trade shows with him when I was a kid. I would call these kids systems for me to get a catalog, email, and all those things. Uh, but his, his emphasis was always on feature grouping, whatever system you're working on. So, so far, these 11 dollars that we spent this far, that we've done that this past year. Um, how much of the infrastructure do we still have yet to under future proof or will allow us to expand um, as the years go by? Because you know, technology is always advancing, or the positive. But, um, where, where are we kind of positioned in that, in that regard as far as the next 20 years? Do uh, you think that the system we have in place now or the last two years? Right, and, and that's a great question, and that idea of looking to the future and your infrastructure preparation is a key part uh, of the infrastructure portion of the next capital technology levy about sort of planning for the growth and expansion about what technology needs growth-wise that we, we know we can't just stay within where we're at now for what, it's, what our students and staff are going to need for future technologies. So that, that is, that's part of the next iteration. It really is part of the life cycle management piece that, that Ken had mentioned about looking at the access points and looking at the different pieces that are in place and, and expanding those and really embracing even the, the flexibility for new technologies that we haven't even, we don't even know about yet, but letting us be able to position ourselves to be able to and take that on. And so we're, as we're updating systems and skills and things like that, that's something that we can do in the case of account? Yes. Yes. So yeah. that, that's kind of brings me to the, my next question, if you ever kind of touched on is about what comes mm -hmm. along as the escrow planning uh, for this. Um, I guess the, the question here is, um, it's not really a question. We keep fund education in crazy ways, right? And bonds are not even one of the crazy ways of fund education. Um, so, without, if we're not able to pass a levy in the next year or so, what, what does that do to our ability to kind of keep going with our infrastructure? Well, our levy really is going to fund the sustainability of the one to one program. So, it would definitely have an impact. Uh, to our ability to do that successfully, to really sustain and update and refresh. That's built into the plan. It's a cycle that started, as Ken mentioned, next year with Everton Sequoia and the teacher devices now. So really, it relies on that regular cycle of, of 
So this is a kind of a must pass for, for our community. Yeah, so, thanks. Um, and then my final question for you is within all this work, um, working with our special education department, what sort of plans or recommendations have come down as far as expanding technology in that area to allow more students to have access? Is there maybe something you can do to a report about either what we have done or what we can do in that area? Yeah, I can, I can include that in an upcoming. Uh, that's a uh, Kelly and I uh, have spent some time planning and visioning for what that's going to look like for both support, um, what the support model is going to look like, the staffing support model, and and the the pieces that would need to be included in that supporting special education moving forward. So I can include that information. Mm -hmm. I think also I'd like to add that you know we're we're working with directors. We will be talking about planning and our summer workshop that we didn't have this opportunity and um, I guess for Dr. Salzman to make sure that we have a really good understanding of that technology component mm -hmm. I can foresee a lot of questions about you know is that all going out going to sustain us how you know where have the shifts been since we you know 2016 what are the unexpecteds and the the growth areas and and you know I mean, I'm asking things like, you know, how long do we keep the device and does it depend on the device mm -hmm. and the user of the device? I'm sure they're all factors, but just to kind of get some framework around our costs right now okay. um, as we get ready to do some um, capital levy plan. I have a couple of questions. Please. Um, uh, so, this is, so you said enrollment. Um, the, the way the LMS system was before, uh, every year I would get a piece of paper home where I had to update emergency contacts, phone numbers, things like that, that, you know, 2,000 students in Jackson, somebody's data entering those, our kids are at Gateway, and I know it wasn't happening because my emergency contact passed away and the form kept coming with her name on it. Mm -hmm. um, does the new computer system enrollment or whatever, or is there plans to allow parents to just do that online? Yes. And so that's a new word thing in the year. Yeah, the, the online, uh, the online, the online enrollment with the update feature would allow parents. And that's, and that's what. So when you mentioned numbers, that's yes. new people coming into the district as well as current people in the district updating contact right. or reviewing something. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you because that is um, much better. Yeah. Um, the next question is: If somebody asked me yesterday about social media for Joanna. Um, <laughs> They seemed actually surprised that we were going to keep computers one to one, and I said, "Well, this is what our money was from, you know, six years ago, and um, we we're rolling it out, and the the, the um, pandemic hit. Um, but maybe I think with the pandemic, we actually I refused to say back to normal because we learned so much. Mm -hmm. I said I, I think it's still to be determined how teachers will embrace using the the the, the Computers in the classroom, but I said there's. I was reading the names of one of the cool programs, but I said there's at least one where it was like a post it note check in where a teacher could still have everybody pull out their computer. Okay, I need you to check in, or it's anonymous, but the teacher can see it just to do that sort of like I see so many things we learned during the pandemic that are going to transfer into the classroom. Exactly. Is that how we're coaching the teachers too? Is is I see a nod from you, and so yeah. this isn't this isn't just something that we're going to close up because of pandemics. Or exactly, it's not a textbook. Right. It's fully using Canvas or and some of those other all those other cool programs we fully yes. embraced. Right, is that that's our that's our new baseline, mm -hmm. and we're moving forward. Thank you. Yeah. This is not back. Yeah, it's like. We work. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. that's it's it, it's it's outstanding. And um, to the previous statements, it is really through our crazy system in this in this state that it is community support that allows this program to happen. Yes. So thank and you. And we're very grateful. Um, yeah, I just have, so first off, thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know why these are my favorite presentations. Everyone knows me, I know. Technology is <laughs> super interesting. Um, and so I, I guess, first off, thank you for, for having that list of things that we're going to keep because I think um, to your presentation is probably there's some really good lessons learned and things that we need to keep going with. Um, I do have a question about hot spots. So the families that we gave hot spots to, do they still have them or don't they? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah they, they, the, the students that, uh, well, the students that have left when they turned in their devices, they would have turned in their hotspots. But, you know, for the most part, our students kept all their technology and their internet connection over the summer. Oh, so um, that's going to happen then. Mm -hmm. And I'm just asking that because um, we've been thinking a lot that we've received about the last, the real last day of school. <laughs> um, and, and I have one of my favorite questions come out. Um, she felt like some of her friends were having a hard time navigating it. She had been turning her for years, yeah. and um, she was like in sophomore. So it was, it had a lot of different, I like that it had a lot of different ways to do the last days, but I will say it felt a little stressful mm -hmm. as a parent because you weren't quite sure, like, oh, am I going to do this? Or does the kid put this button? It was a, it was a little bit out there. So, but I guess that said, we have success with it, but we did people actually show up. Well, I, I, I would say, um, I, I would say looking at attendance data, I would say yes. Yes. Okay. So just, you know, our family's at the low bar, like when we say, oh, people need to check in or to the reference, and we know how to do it, we can't do that. So, okay, yeah, so people did get that email, and understand it. And then my last question is just around business partners, because I did feel like the beginning of the pandemic, it wasn't pretty well, like the districts that had relationships with Frontier and the districts that had relationships with Microsoft, they seem to get the, the, the top of the, the line for um, tech stuff. And so, I guess, how are we building those relationships? Um, like, is it local? And like, like, what type of relationships are we looking at? Like, well, I would say for us, some of the existing relationships that we really fostered, you mentioned Microsoft is one. Uh, Microsoft, Google, those are some partners that we meet with regularly. So the local business partnerships are the ones, so yes, Comcast, Frontier, Zipley, Presidio, those are some of the local ones that, uh, that we really connected with. But, um, you know, fostering business relationships beyond that, um, I, I, I think that that's important locally in Everett and in the Snohomish County area. That's really a focus for us looking ahead beyond some of the, the current um, ones, the, the big, I guess you should say the, the, the big one. Yeah. I guess that's where I was wondering, maybe if you're already talking about just the social level that we all have and understanding you know, the needs and not to have our own bio and having those things and relationships to be great. So, you know, programs or initiatives, I'm seeing these programs too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have any questions, but I do have a comment. My comment is thank you so very much. You mentioned a culture of innovation. I think you had it well before the and I think we had it well before the pandemic when we had our communities that were at 2016 and when we decided we were going one to one. And we not gone that step as Director Mason mentioned, uh, we would have been back peddling during this whole time. And I would like to thank your team because they have worked very hard to ensure that education still takes place mm -hmm. and learning still takes place. And you went forward with giving teachers professional development and how to integrate the curriculum with the technology and move that forward and working with the curriculum department. And in all of that, that's, that's fantastic. So we have that culture of innovation and I can only see that growing and going and I'm concerned still with broadband access to some of our very challenging students in Redmond and want to ensure that as we move forward, they aren't left at home mm -hmm. and that they are continually, and I know federal funds will help and support that, but I want us to make sure that we continue to focus our, our, our outlook on are they still with us mm -hmm. and what are we doing to ensure that they are continuing to go forward with us as we go forward but i do want to say yes you've already had that culture of innovation and you've worked wonders with it and our district with wonders with it and i want us to continue that with our teachers and ensure that all teachers 
of the websites mm -hmm. updated and all teachers are using Canvas and all teachers are being created and that we are continuing to foster that professional development for them because that we are still learning. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Profile, thank you <laughs> for the great presentation. I can say it now. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, we will move forward in our next item of business is 4.0 information and discussion. And this evening we do not have an information or discussion item, which takes us to unfinished business. And we also do not have any unfinished business tonight. Which takes us to new business, uh, section 14.0 of the agenda. And Mr. Fleckenstein is going to give us updates on five policies. So, whenever you're ready, please. <laughs> Five to bring up at once, so I apologize for the delay. No well, good evening. Um, so, uh, tonight for our first policy presented is a proposed revisions to policy 4414 audience participation. Changes would allow for live online public comments during regular board meetings via Zoom while continuing the board's current practice for the public to provide a board, board comments in person while in the boardroom. And you can see that the revisions here in the policy are quite minimal as the change to this process is actually embedded in the procedure itself. Director listening. Yes, I had one question. And one of the things when I was reading over this, I first thought that the, you have a sentence in there where it says to print fair and board expressions of public comment, the board will provide a period of time at the meeting room which you know, visitors may address the board on any topic. I, I first thought, or I assume I'm mistaken, that it had to be a topic on, of which was on the agenda. Have there been any discussions in the past, or with WASDA, that mentioned the, if a comment came in, it had to be pertaining to an item that was on the agenda? I'm not aware of that requirement, um, that it has to be only related to topics on the agenda itself. So if a person came in to discuss the matter, they could talk on any item. I know we don't comment. We don't provide any comments uh, while they, or after they conclude with their questions. Is there any pluses or minuses as to any topic versus an item which is on the agenda. I think tonight's a good example of that. Mm -hmm. Our public speaker did not comment on an item on the agenda. Yeah. I I, I am not aware of that. Um, generally, that, that's never been a. Yeah, generally, with that, I mean, I would consider an inappropriate invitation of public speech. I agree. Um, because somebody can come in here, we you know nothing about you know, funding. Uh, the funding is, is kind of integral to all we do, and then we have to have property taxes and things and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it might be something that we're taking action on at this very moment, but we don't hear about that for people out there. I 
to raise discussion. <laughs> no, yeah, so I got a couple questions and I kind of didn't, um, I, I guess I, I did this kind of thing in the talk and then I'll, and, um, it, you know, so I guess I'm wondering first off, 15 minutes, and I know that's not what we're choosing or discussing, but I don't know, like, so the 15 minutes is going to increase us five people, essentially. Um, it seems very compliant. And so for the so situations, we have expanded it. So, and I know, but it's, 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 that's also arbitrary and subjective, right? Because that's just, it's just it's subjective, like we can, we can not do the same thing. I guess for, I'm just trying to tell my citizen how uh, my resident hat, saying that we to look at this policy, um, also in other districts that can use the local point power or something like that. And I know we've all in our districts. The communities that have had longer public comment for the because there's, there's stuff that people want to get off their chest. I'm just, I'm just asking, um, so I, I would like to person to change back to piece of it. I just feel like if given um, public speech and given the, at least our agenda is 24 hours ahead of time, right? We release it on Monday mornings. Um, and that's very limited for us. So I mean, for all intents and purposes, when you see on Friday night, what gives people like an opportunity to really digest it. So we've got that limitation. We are in a very large district, and we don't necessarily have a mandated representation from across the district. And we have you know, long terms, and we just say, you know, if you do want to talk to us, you get every other week, you can get 15 minutes total and you ask one of the first five people to sign up, otherwise it's out of discussion. It just feels, at some point, people feel like we're busy trying to walk them out of the process instead of walking them in. And it's, it's perception because as long as I've been on the board, we've never had that, right? I mean, that's so, it's not something that's saying that we're doing wrong. I think we're doing a lot of things right. But what I'm saying is it's perception, and sometimes when we have perceptions like that, to which point we have the necessity of passing bonds and levies, sometimes the perception affects people in the, in the decisions that they make in their home. So, okay. so what I'm asking is, is it just going to be more alignment with the districts of our size to say, to make that period for public comment a little longer? Um, what, what, help me understand, yeah. just clarify your perception, your <laughs> perception so, or the perception so that 15 minutes is yeah. limiting because my experience has been, at least my time on the board, is when we have had a large crowd, we have always expanded the time to allow people to speak. Yeah. Sure, sure. And, yeah. and one of the, um, the difficulties is we schedule that block of time into our agenda. And so that um, also allows for people to better understand when public comment may be, when it's going to end, and if they want to see presentations towards the end of the meeting, it offers a better understanding of the timing of our business meeting so that they can join if they want to join. Absolutely. And public comment is also not the only way they can move to the board, as we well know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and there's been in, the, in the time that I've been on the board, we have had maybe a less than a handful of times in which the crowd has been large enough that people wanted to speak. And during those times when we had more than five people speak, we've allowed them the extra time to speak. We have never taken away the time from the public to speak. But I still want to make it clear that this is still a business meeting, and the 15 minutes is there so that we can continue the business of the board and we can have set times so that people, as the director makes me mention, can come in and see and be able to be present during certain items. Um, I think I think we we do allow the public to speak longer than they appear. In fact at one particular point in time we had two public comment sessions so that if they didn't make the first time, they could show up at the second time and we allowed them to speak. And we did that for over a year, two years. We did that for over a year and then it was realized that it didn't take the time. 
to come in during both comment periods in order to speak. So then we reevaluated that and we changed it back to 15 minutes. But in the time that I've been here, it's less than a handful of times in which less than five, less than five times uh, in which we have and more speak beyond the 15 minutes. And when they do, we get off that. And I think that the end is that kind of point is that it's really good. It's us allowing it versus people having the right to do it. And so we're not on the wall, but we can all, you know, go on grade and like and say that if there's ever a situation or a scenario where there's different board members are different, and at this point, you know, we can all go in the same boat, right? And that's if we don't, but we can. And that for me and in democracy, that's a problem. Like, I don't, I don't see that. Because we don't, we can just work out right now, doesn't mean it's always going to work out. And I think. This policy for me is one of those situations where I think it's great that we can gracious and push a lot of things. They can speak as long as they want. I'm just worried that in you know, five years when I'm on the board, the person that takes my seat might not be as gracious, right? They might say, this is 15 minutes, time's up. But in addition to that, opening the online portal, so how do we close them up? Is it the first person that logged in online that starts the 15 minutes? But how did that how does that work? Right. So now we're saying people can be online in person and the person that shows up at four o'clock. Well they, the they can fill out a form at any point in time prior to the meeting and then you take it in the order that they fill out that form. So they can come here tonight and fill out the form, but they can also do it in advance even if they want to be here in person. So then so if I want to testify and I can let's say I'm just reading the rules and I want to make sure I'm one of those first five people. Well, what's my best strategy? And I'm actually asking someone. <laughs> well, so I, I guess what I'm not understanding is you're trying to solve a problem that has actually to me never existed. And, and so, that's exactly what I'm thinking. That's but, what I'm but that's why we have five directors. Is even if someone took your seat that didn't agree with that, you would need the consensus of. So there's a vote. There doesn't say vote. It's like five years right now. Pressure. So, I, I, I'm, I just, I'm genuinely confused on how this works in the classroom. We have usually, well, let me say this the times yeah. in which I was president, I asked for consent. So, 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 so I asked for, is it okay if we go ahead and continue to open the door for further dialogue? Mm -hmm. Because we have a large body of community residents who speak. And with a nod of a head, yes, okay, we're, we're, we'll allow for this to continue on for 15, 30 minutes, whatever is necessary. So then, so, so in yeah. order for people I, to see. So for me, it's, it's when I get that, and I, I think that's awesome. I just see it as a potential problem because now, because this is how it goes, I don't, I mean, if I'm a citizen of your home or a representative of a parent, I'm reading this policy and I'm saying, What's my strategy to make sure I'm part of that person's group? Because it, it's a you know, good parents, and I wish it don't all know us and know how wonderful we are and that we're our heads. I just don't. And so, and what we've been in the district, we're so organized. We've got policies and procedures for every single thing, everything. And that's stuff that I didn't even think of. And I'm just wondering in this situation, sometimes I'm like, oh, well, it's always going to work itself out, well, and it won't. And I just, if the last year's top <clears throat> happening, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to say it's always going to work itself out. So I'm just wondering if we could expand the permit to one hour and see if people come, but not to say that we'll ever have to do that. And then also just that process for how we can figure out what's the strategy that I would tell the parents to make sure their voice is heard. Again, if it's my voting company, if it's me, I'm going to have to use more and I'm not everybody on the rise, it's, it's just nice. I just, I'm just trying to figure out what that is all. Here's one, here's one thought on this. If we were to extend it for an hour, we would then have to adjust every item to, so that it's presented in the agenda at a different time. That would tell me at 50, if we went and we did not have, we would have to wait I an hour. I don't know if that's true. I'm disappointed for this. I don't know if that's, so I said, so this is the first time I've seen each of this time out. Where it would have to be done at certain points. It, it's they will be in early sometimes, it can be later sometimes. But there's, as far as I know, I'm not a lawyer. 
I don't think it's anything about our agenda. If we stay in this call, we end up doing it up over an hour. Um, you know, the more a common discretion, I don't think that really reminds us to sit there for an hour waiting for. Well, I, don't, I don't know, but we do have, sorry, there are staff that might plan arriving for presentation at a certain time. Um, of attorneys that we have um, time after the meeting. And so that if we're suddenly, an sure. attorney is planning on meeting with us at 7.30, because that's when we can bring our yeah. hands up. Um, but we say, no, can you do 6.30? We, the attorney might say, I'm busy at 6.30, I was planning on 7.30, so then we might be waiting for that executive meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would be asking for an exception. We asking that, but we can, you know. But but again, we're asking, asking for an exception that has not happened. And um, I think we've had a discussion for here. Do 
And we'll give a request that Mr. Blackenstein comes back with a second version of the revisions for us to do we put it in unfinished business? Um, if I understand with that for now. And if I understand the board's um, conversation, you would like to have the board through general consent provide additional time for public comment, is that correct? In the revision? Yes. Okay. Is there any sort of time limit that you would like in that revised draft in terms of a maximum amount of time allowed? At this point, we're going to take that discussion up at the ER Center Workshop and shall we decide on a different time limit that we would revise the policy to reflect that? Okay, I can do that. Okay. Your notes on our summer work <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, with that, we'll go ahead and move to the next policy, please. All right. Um, wow, we propose deletion of policy 3240, student conduct expectations and sanctions. As much of the information in this policy is no longer a part of the current legal framework regarding student discipline and other policies and procedures, specifically policy 3300, have incorporated any information from this policy that continues to be relevant. Any questions or comments? Um, the following three policy revisions are interrelated as it relates to changes in House Bill 1176 that amended RCW 28A 635-060, which previously allowed school districts to withhold a student's grades, transcript, and or diploma in the event the student did not make proper restitution for fines or damage charges levied for lost or damaged textbooks, library books, or equipment. Now, with these revisions, districts may no longer uh, withhold the grades or transcripts of the student with an unpaid fee or fine. Only the student's diploma may still be withheld until the student or the student's parent or guardian has paid any outstanding fines or fees or restitution has been made. So that's just a piece of paper that they don't get. Yes, their official diploma will not be given to them until we've resolved any fine fees and charges. Okay, thank you. Yes, but the transcripts will indicate if the student did graduate. Yeah, right. Yes, we are not withholding transcripts um, under these revisions so any longer, or uh, grades. Right, because a parent may not pay, a student should not be. Um, Negatively affected by the fact that it was not secure. Yeah, yeah. And, and recall your current practice within our school district through your policies and our procedures is to allow for other means of taking care of fines, fees, and outstanding charges on a student's account right. rather than having to have payment. So we have a way to resolve in any sort of situation for families to ensure access for all. Okay, no further questions, we'll move this to second meeting. Policy 3600 student records is also amended due to change to RCW 28A 635-060, which mandates districts may no longer hold the grades or transcripts of a student with an unpaid fee or fine. Only the student's diploma may be withheld until the student or the student's parent or guardian has paid for any outstanding fines or made restitution with the school district. Very similar changes. Any additional questions or comments? Hang on, we will move this to second meeting. Thank you. And then finally, changes to policy 6531, care of district property, are also to comply with amendments to the RCW I've stated earlier, <laughs> uh, which mandates only the student's diploma may be withheld until such time any outstanding fines or damage to district property or restitution thereof has been completed. Any questions regarding policy 6531? Okay, we'll go ahead and move this to second reading and thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, 
new business behind us. We will now move to upcoming agenda items. And we have a couple. Dr. Sussman, will you please provide an overview? Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. At the July 1 regular meeting, the board will discuss the following. New administrator's recognition, strategic plan end of year progress, 2021-2022 budget adoption first reading, third quarter financial report, May financial report, school resource officer update, performance matters agreement, while full policies for second reading. At the August 17th, which is our um, next special meeting, August 17th, 2021, the board will attend the board and workshop. Thank you. Our next item of business is an executive or closed session, and we held a special meeting earlier this afternoon to cover actually both of those, an executive and a closed session. So we will not have one at this time, which takes us to 17.0, which is adjournment. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.